And let's welcome Eric Lander, who's going to talk about secrets of the human genome. Welcome, Eric. Thanks very much. Um, amongst the, the speakers, or amongst the prize winners, um, I think David and I are, are perhaps the most closely linked. And I just want to acknowledge that, that um, anybody who hasn't heard David talk before, you now know David. Um, <laughs> and I, I had the wonderful pleasure of meeting David outside MIT's seminar room, 10 to 50 in 1985 um, when uh, David uh, cornered me with a question. And you might not be surprised to know he had a strong opinion about it. And we got into a wonderful um, well, discussion. He's from the Bronx. I'm from Brooklyn. It's, you know, you would call it an argument, but for us this was a discussion. And we had a marvelous time talking. And we began collaborating, and it changed my life completely. I got into human genetics because of that argument discussion with David that turned into a collaboration intensely over the course of weeks and months and a friendship over years. And it's just a real special pleasure to share this with David. So I wanted to say that. And David also failed to describe any of the things for which he got this prize. Um, <laughs> Notwithstanding the fact that those were the instructions. <laughs> and uh, anticipating that, I will remedy the situation. <laughs> so in any case, um, my theme is going to be secrets of the human genome, uh, the power of big data in biology. And there's something fitting to that in that this prize, this new prize, is a, is a product of Silicon Valley and the world of big data. And so the idea that one of the really remarkable transformations that has occurred in biology in the past several decades is it's gone from a field in which the only relevant data was in your lab book to a field in which almost every experiment uses vast amounts of data that reside elsewhere. And there's no end in sight to this. And this is an important change. So the problem. This is the problem I've sort of always been interested in, which is and David recognizes the slide since I've been using it since I knew David. And I clipped it out of the Sunday Times Magazine one morning and took a picture of it, which is, there's, I mean, every geneticist is interested in variation, the extraordinary variation in our species as represented by differences in height and weight and, and skin color and other things like that, but also the things you don't see, risks of diabetes and Alzheimer's and, and predispositions to colon cancer. And you just want to understand what's all this wonderful difference about. So I'll tell the story in four parts. Part one, principles for mapping disease genes. Really a set of discussions, all of which took place in the 1980s. So the issue is the human genome is big, 3 billion bases. Genes are small, 3,000 bases of coding information, maybe even, a little less actually. And mutations are even smaller, a base. This is a big difference. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. Actually, if you do the calculation, it's considerably worse than finding a needle in a haystack. Needles represent a significantly larger portion of haystacks than this. <laughs> so as you look at this, three basic methods were developed in the 1980s, conceived in the 1980s, not really practical in the 1980s, but they were all pretty clear. And I just want to talk about them. The idea that if you had a rare monogenic trait you could find what the gene was without in advance knowing its biology by mapping it in families, tracing its inheritance. Then the idea that for many important traits, it wasn't single rare genes, but probably multiple genes that were combining, and ways in which you might be able to detect the genes for polygenic traits. And there, single families were really not very helpful. But being able to accept, you know, in some cases, they can be helpful if you have a rare Mendelian trait that represents a subtype of a common trait. But for most of the garden variety types, you really do have to look more broadly. And they are being able to look across whole populations and perform a different kind of genetic analysis can be pretty powerful. 
And then another idea that was already floating around in the 1980s was not the inherited genetic differences, but the somatic, the inquired genetic differences, and discovering them by comparing tumors and normal. So it's all kind of very simple. Of course, the details of how you would do that were a little complicated. And in the case of rare monogenic disorders, Huntington's disease, cystic fibrosis, diastrophic dysplasia, it's flamingly obvious to you now how to do it, but it wasn't really obvious. People spent a lot of time thinking about the biology very hard to find the candidate gene to do something, and David's remarkable contribution was in this paper in 1980 in which he said, not surprisingly, it's just like yeast. And and in the paper, he said, in, in any sensible organism, fruit flies since 1911, you trace genes by looking at a linked genetic marker. It defines a segment that is transmitted together through meiosis. And by tracing markers, the marker doesn't have to be the cause of the disease. It just has to be near enough that it stays together through the meioses in a family. And therefore, you could map the locations of genes. That was the theory. And if you had some genetic markers, you could do it, which at the time you didn't. But that didn't stop David from pointing out that if you did, you could. And he said you should get them, meaning you should make a genetic map. Now, as I say, common genetic diseases, we suspected and we now know, have many different genes that are involved. I'll come back to, to uh, age-related macular degeneration, inflammatory bowel disease, lipids and heart attack and schizophrenia later in the talk, but all of them are polygenic uh, disorders that have many different influences on them. And so here, the idea is a little trickier. The idea is that um, instead of being able to look at a marker and trace it perfectly in a family, well, you have a lot of different things going on, you really need to combine information across a whole population. But across a whole population, how are you going to recognize where a particular allele is? Well, it turns out that in populations, there are segments of DNA that have stayed together for a long period of time. And if they've stayed together, you can recognize them, even though you don't have the familiar relationships, by markers within that segment. And if you have enough markers, I can say, I see that segment in multiple places and in multiple people, and it's enriched in people with the disease. And so you don't have to know the gene, you can do it with markers and segments. I wish, I wish I could say we originally thought of that in its full glory, but we initially thought about it over dinner in Finland, uh, because Finland is the place to think about this. Finland was started by, an, by a, a population migration uh, about 2,000 years ago, and it's such a small group that founded it that individual monogenic diseases basically have only one allele that came through the bottleneck, or zero. And so almost everybody who has the disorder has the same exact segment, and that's what gave us the clue to the idea that you could recognize those segments by thinking about Finland. We wrote a calculation that said, oh yeah, you could, you could see things back even without families by just picking people. And then with some more thinking over a little time, it became clear that, well, Europe wasn't so different than Finland. It just wasn't so obvious. You had to go a little further. And actually, the whole world wasn't so different. But you could detect ancestral segments in that way, as long as you had an even denser set of markers than David wanted for the monogenic disorders. Then over time, with the eventual sequencing of the human genome, you can go beyond detecting the ancestral segment and its association with the disease to simply detecting a pileup of rare individual alleles but that you can only do with full sequencing and frankly that's only just becoming possible now with enough sequencing power. So then for cancer, well Renato Dubeca wrote a very famous article in 1986 calling for a human genome project on the grounds that cancer needed this, that either you were going to do this you know, one at a time by brute force, piecemeal as he called it, or you were going to have the entire genome of a species to do cancer. And the idea, in principle, is, well, if you knew the entire genome, you might be able to recognize genes that were important to cancer simply because they were mutated very often in cancer. It's not such a hard idea in theory. In fact, in practice, you have to be really careful to be able to do that right. But the idea is you'd be able to see that even if you weren't as smart as Bob Weinberg and hadn't done this transformation assay, just by looking, you should, rest should leap out at you. And maybe everything could leap out at you by virtue of the fact that there was an excess of mutations in tumors. So all right, 
Those were the principles all sort of discussed in the 1980s. Now, from principles to practice, that's, uh, you know, that's a little bit harder because, well, it was going to require making a complete map of the human genome, a genetic map of those spelling differences up and down the chromosomes that could be used to trace inheritance, a physical map of all the overlapping pieces of DNA, because the, the barbaric techniques of the 19, late 1980s uh, where one walked along chromosomes tediously to cover tens of kilobases to get to a gene, and you could have labs, a hundred people involved in cloning cystic fibrosis, spending tens of millions of dollars to walk along a chromosome and get to a gene, was triumphant, but not something you wanted to reproduce a lot. So we needed physical maps. We needed sequence maps. We needed the gene lists marked up in the sequences. We needed to also to have all the information freely, completely available to every graduate student on the planet and every biotech company. So uh, now, just for scale again, this was a large molecular structure. An amino acid is 200 Daltons. The DNA helix, 6,000 Daltons. The hemoglobin, 20,000 Daltons. The ribosome, 2 million Daltons. The human genome, just to think about it as, as a chemical structure, is 2 trillion Daltons. It's a very large structure, and it really did take a lot of work to think about how do you solve a structure this large. And yeah, well, it went from little things, like David had called for a genetic map, and David and I and others were involved in building a first genetic map, which is so hilarious to read the abstract. It had 402 genetic variants in the map, but it did link across the whole genome, so you could trace things, but you really needed the whole thing. And so the, the field of genomics went into a, a period of automation, building automated factories with conveyor belts and all sorts of things. And, and there had been worries it was going to consume all the graduate students, but in fact the machines did the job, not the graduate students. The graduate students did the thinking. That was a good thing. Uh, and it involved really a first international collaboration across the scientific community at this scale, involving six different countries, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Japan, and China working together toward a common goal. So the Human Genome Project was finished. It was actually finished multiple times. We had many parties to, to announce the completion of the human genome. There was the party at the White House in June of 2000. There was the party I took more seriously when we actually published a paper as opposed to a press release. And that, of course, was just a rough draft sequence that still was missing 10% of the genome and had about a quarter of a million holes and a bunch of errors. But the International Consortium pressed on and produced a finished sequence of the human genome by April 25, 2003, which you'll recognize as the 50th anniversary of the Watson Crick paper. And even the finished sequence wasn't really finished. It still had about 300 gaps and all that, but it was much closer claim to being finished. It didn't do centromeres and telomeres and things like that. So um, then the question was decoding this genome. Much of the 2000s has been devoted to decoding this genome. So there was some hope on the part of some that when the Human Genome Project was done, we could be done with all of these large-scale crazy maps. That has not turned out to be the case. Having one sequence of the human genome has meant that anybody can start building more maps on top of it. You get any information you want, lay it on top of that map, and just like Google Maps, you can lay on top the traffic patterns, and you can lay on top the pizzerias and all these things, and then think about how long it'll take to get to the pizzeria. All of that cross-referencing of data has been the theme of the last 10 years. We've seen a tremendous amount of work now to build the maps of what are all the genes encoded there, to sequence more than 50 different mammalian species and lay them on top of each other and ask what nucleotides are conserved across those species, to take antibodies against particular chromatin modifications and pull down particular modified histones or other factors binding to DNA and grab the DNA that's attached to your favorite protein, sequence it, and thereby build maps of chromatin state freeze in place the DNA of a cell by cross-linking, and then build 3D structure maps by asking, through proximity-based ligation, who's near whom. And you can lay all these on top of the same genome. 
by sequencing lots of people, inherited variation maps to collect all the variation in the human species, and then disease association maps of the sort I was referring to, and evolutionary selection maps, where by looking at segments that have moved to very high frequency very quickly and are very large, to be able to pick out just by staring at it things that had to have been selective sweeps in population genetics, and then cancer gene maps, and it goes on and on. In addition, the other important intellectual difference was completeness. Having a complete catalog meant that a reduced signature was enough. 30, 50, amino, 50 nucleotides was enough to recognize a particular gene because there was no other gene that had that sequence. 30, 20 amino acids was enough to recognize a protein in a mass spec because you could say there was no other protein it could be. And so completeness began to change the experimental tools we had available to us. And then, of course, technology has been stunning over this past decade, decreasing the costs from the time of that first human genome, which cost us three billion bucks, by a factor of about a million fold. And nothing I know of has ever fallen by a million fold in cost. Even in Silicon Valley, they recognize this to be about three times faster than Moore's Law. Quite a remarkable drop. So let's say, what has this taught us? It's taught us a lot. Like, let me start by reminding you what things we knew for certain in the year 2001. I know this because I teach introductory biology at MIT and I know what I teach each year. I keep my notes. I know that the official party line was there were about 100,000 protein coding genes in the human genome, that there was a small amount of regulatory sequence associated with each gene, promoters and some enhancers and things like that, but it was small compared to the protein coding. There were 20 examples of RNAs that, and RNA classes that were not translated into protein, and they were weird and interesting exceptions. And we knew the genome was littered with transposons, and they were junk and parasites and other pejorative words. So the progress over the past decade has been to learn that everything that I had on the final exam was wrong. <laughs> so for example, there's not 100,000 genes. There's only 21,000 protein coding genes. And it's evolutionary comparison that's taught us this. We can see the distinctive patterns that proteins have over evolution, the types of mutations that occur. And by lining them up, there's a whole, we have whole papers on this, so I won't go into the details. You can say there's about 21,000 protein coding genes, and nobody's found any more since then. I mean, you find few here and a few there. That number's held up remarkably well, a lot fewer than we expected. With regard to regulatory elements being less than coding sequences, it's actually quite the opposite. There are millions now, more than three million identified regulatory sequences, and we can tell it by virtue of the fact that they don't encode proteins, but they're highly conserved. And you can see just from the conservation curves over there that the human genome has too much conservation, more than it would have by chance, and it's about six percentage points of the genome, and only one percentage point, one and a half percent, is protein coding. So most of it is regulatory. And as you begin to look closely, you find that early developmental transcription factors, for example, 200 of them across the genome, have a little bit of red protein coding sequence and a tremendous amount of purple regulatory sequence around them. And it's actually what distinguishes us, we can say, from other mammals is much less the red than the purple. It's the purple that's evolving across mammals. With regard to non-coding RNAs, well, it turns out there, aren't, there are more than 20. There's probably about four or 5,000 functional non-coding RNAs. There's a lot of transcription all over the genome. People like to talk about I ignore that. I mean, things that make bona fide transcripts that actually show evolutionary conservation, that show conserved promoters and things like that. And you can really find them strikingly. Once you know what the protein coding genes are and you look using the chromatin maps, you find bona fide loci that have the right chromatin structure, make transcripts, et cetera, et cetera. There's now been knockouts of these things and several of them are lethal. Um, they look like they bind proteins and most recently we've shown that they're pretty cool ideas for regulating because a protein, well, a protein, the RNA's got to go out, get translated, and come back. It doesn't remember where it came from. An RNA gets made at a location, and it can take advantage of its locus as a piece of information for what it wants to regulate. And so EXIST takes advantage of that, and I think there's increasing evidence that there's something special about being an RNA that will allow you to direct to particular loci nearby in the 3D structure of the genome. So in any case, thousands of genes that we didn't even suspect. Transposons still, well, they still are junk mostly and parasites mostly. 
But it turns out that if you look carefully about everything that's evolved in the 90 million years before, between our divergence from marsupials and the mammalian radiation, well, at least 20% of the stuff that was evolved in that period got there carried by a transposon. The transposons, while most of the time do nothing useful, turn out to be, well, I don't know, on the internet they say go viral, right? Well, it turns out the transposons worked this out long before the internet. Good ideas go viral in the genome through this viral mechanism of transposition. So now I want to turn to the topic that had been the subject of discussions in the 1980s, including outside the lecture room 10250, of how are we doing toward finding the genetic basis of traits and diseases? So let's start with the Mendelian diseases, the sort of things that David had laid out in that 1980 paper, where he said you could trace inheritance patterns in families and find the segments and clone the genes. Well, before the Human Genome Project started, there were about 70 examples of human disease genes that had been identified. By the time the Human Genome Project completed, even you know, before it was done, but tools were being released all along the way, 1,300. And by today, something like 3,500 human simple monogenic disorders have now been associated with specific genes. We're not done yet. The Victor McCusick's catalog has approximately another 1,800 conditions that are listed there. And there are a lot more that probably haven't been discovered that will be discovered with these tools. But it's doing pretty well. Um, it's the case that. You can't just sequence one patient and figure out what the mutation is. You can almost do that for a recessive disease because the chance of two hits in the same gene is such that you expect about one such occurrence on average in a genome. But a handful of patients for a recessive disease is enough to know. Dominant diseases are a little harder, so maybe you need a dozen or more. But it's not so bad to, to do that. Now, for polygenic disorders, how so? Well. There, the principle was initially, let's see if we can start by looking for the ancestral segments that appear in, a, in, in lots of people in the population and correlate them with the presence of disease. So that would initially involve finding a lot of genetic variants all over the human genome and mapping them in large numbers of patients. Well, in 1998, when these ideas were still being worked through, there were only about 4,000 genetic variants. But it quickly went up with the Human Genome Project to 1.4 million to today, more than 20 million such genetic variants. And then it turns out you don't have to look at each one separately because the ones that are nearby are correlated with each other. And an international project worked out the whole, uh, Mark Daly in, in my lab discovered that they were correlated in this way. And then an international project worked out what that whole correlation structure was across the genome, which meant you could pick a subset and catch most of those segments. And then tools went from doing this one at a time to doing it 10 at a time to doing it at millions at a time using DNA chips. So the experience for us who were in the field went from worldwide about one gene associated with some common disease being discovered per year to, by 2005, four discoveries reported. 2006, eight discoveries reported. In 2007, a lot of discoveries reported. And by now, more than 2,000 loci, actually, that, that's wrong, 3,000 loci now, associated with more than 225 common diseases and traits have been mapped. So what are they teaching us? Well, let's just take examples like adult macular degeneration, inflammatory bowel disease, lipids, and heart attack, and schizophrenia. So for adult macular degeneration, well, we basically knew nothing about the genetic causes of it. And it's now clear that three genes explain more than half of the risk of macular degeneration. And their names are complement factor H, complement factor B, and complement component 2. And even if you knew nothing, you would now guess that the complement system was involved in this disease. It's actually the alternative complement system. And it is. And this has completely changed our understanding of the biology of it. Inflammatory bowel disease. That's one we had worked on a lot in the lab. And now it's up to about 163 loci strongly, definitively, reproducibly associated with inflammatory bowel disease. You say, 163 loci, this is terrible. Well, I don't know, yeast geneticists, they want to do a saturation mutagenesis. They want to do a mutant hunt and collect all the things and then sort them into pathways. Happily, the loci are sorting into pathways. 
There's about seven or eight pathways that make sense here. Not all of them have yet been crammed into these pathways, but IL-23 signaling, autophagy, innate immunity, ER stress. And these are beginning to now make sense in coherent pathways. Mouse models validate when people have made them so far, uh, the expectations here. And so there's beginning to become a coherent biology that's emerged, not unlike what people do in yeast by just collecting the mutants. Lipid levels in early onset heart attack. Well, here, Sake Kathreesen and also Kristen Willer have done beautiful work. Uh, most recently, we've got about 157 loci for, for uh, these loci, uh, for, for lipid levels. They catch all but three of the Mendelian disease loci, all the current drug targets. Uh, the target of the statins, HMG CoA reductase, comes up. The common variant in the population makes a very little difference, but that doesn't matter. It tells you it's in the biology there. And PCSK9 is a beautiful example of a low frequency common variant at about 2% stop code on segregating in the African American population. But a particularly interesting thing is this that um, you can do the following well, let me, let me say high LDL is bad. High L HDL is good. Everybody knows that. HDL is the good cholesterol. We know the drugs that lower your LDL protect you from heart attack, and drugs that would raise your HDL therefore must protect you from heart attack. Well, there's actually no reason to believe the fact that the epidemiological correlation would translate to pharmacological benefit. It could just be that high HDL is associated with something else that, that protects you from heart attack, and increasing your HDL, unless you increase that other thing, isn't going to help you. So you, genetics can help you out on this. If you take the loci that are associated, and this is beautiful work of St. Catherine's and others, the loci that are associated with LDL, you can show that LDL raising loci clearly increase risk of heart attack. The HDL raising loci have no benefit on heart attack. This would have been good to know, for example, before one spent several billion dollars developing each of several HDL-raising drugs, for example, uh, which, some of which didn't do so well. Schizophrenia, a disease where we don't have a good model in a dish for schizophrenia. I'll just say it's been a really interesting case where a number of people, Mark Daly and Stefan Ripke and Steve McCarroll and Sean Purcell, have been very persistent here. They did what at the time was a significant study. Uh, 3,000 cases, 3,000 controls, and they found zero results, which was enough to convince the NIMH it should not continue this work. <laughs> Happily, with some philanthropic support, they went further, and they went to 10,000 and 10,000 and found five significant genes. They then went further to 25,000 and 25,000, 62 significant genes. They went up to 40,000 and 50,000. There are now 93 significant loci, and they're really interesting. There are four subunits to the L-type calcium channel. All four come up as hits. This is not an accident. There's a set of genes involved in the, post in the activity related complex of the postsynaptic density genes. They come up highly enriched. RNA is bound by the fragile X mental retardation protein, uh, protein come up enriched. Glutamate receptors and dopamine D2 receptors now are coming up just most recently. So there you go. So I'm going to move on to the last topic. Cancer. So the idea for cancer was once we had the human genome, could we go back and do what Renato Dobeco had wanted us to do, which is go look at cancer genomes and see if you could discover things? Well, international consortia got started to do this. A, a committee of the National Cancer Institute suggested we have a project. Projects got started. Sequencing would let you, by sequencing tumors and normals and comparing them, recognize all the differences. And what I'll say is, notwithstanding all the amazing work on signaling pathways, the last several years have produced lots of genes that are involved in cancer that we had not suspected. Many involved in chromatin, many involved in splicing, many transcription factors. And it's becoming clear that there are lots of processes that can give rise that can contribute to giving rise to cancer. So I just want to tell you about, in the closing couple of minutes, the a study that will come out uh, in a couple of weeks, where we ask, how far could you go with this genomic idea? So it's a study of about 5,000 tumors across 21 different tumor types. And it's work with Gaddy Getz and others at the Broad. They are a variety of different tumor types. They have a variety of different mutation rates within and across tumors. 
And what we looked for were, were there genes that had too many mutations? Now, you have to be very careful. The background rate across the genome is heterogeneous. If you don't correct for that, you get completely screwed up. But if you correct for that, you can get this right. Genes that had too many mutations given the background rate, genes who had clustered mutations, and genes that had mutations particularly in conserved regions. And to make a long story short, to make a long story short, first, you can look. And here, this is homage to Weinberg and Cantley and Vogelstein. For their genes, which you've heard about already, it's pretty obvious. You don't need fancy statistics to tell you that those genes have highly significant patterns, that there are unusual concurrences in mutations, too many inactivating mutations, mutations piled up in colon cancer, et cetera. You can find all that. In fact, across the 21 different tumor types, you can get highly significant sets of genes that are involved. So the question is, with this, can you find all known cancer genes? Can we find new cancer genes? And how far are we from a complete catalog? So the short answer to the first question is yes. The longer answer is in the paper. Basically, you can rediscover all the genes that, that you expect to find there. Can we find new cancer genes? The answer is yes. More than 33 very strongly plausible genes emerge from this where the biology makes good sense and the types of mutations make good sense for their function. I'll give you an example of a small GTPase Reb here. You can see a pileup of five exact Y35N mutations in the effector domain of this small GTPase. The statistics and common sense tell you it's meaningful. The same for another small GTPase Rho A comes up significant here in head and neck cancer. RAD21 comes up significant in AML, and two of its partners come up significant, have already known to be significant in AML, and PCBP1, a gene that blocks the translation of certain genes by binding to poly-C regions, comes up significant. It hits leucines, two leucines that are involved in dimerization of a particular domain. There's about 33 very good examples. So are we done yet? The short answer is we're not close to done. How can we tell? We just did 5,000. What if we'd done 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000? What's the discovery curve look like? Here's the discovery curve within tumor type and across tumor types. And the short summary is it's going up and it's not flattening out. And you could ask, what if I broke it out by frequency? By frequency, it looks like this. A gene that is mutated at a rate of 20% in some cancer, any cancer, maximum rate observed 20%, we're virtually saturated on. That's the red curve. But genes that are between 10 and 20%, the orange curve, we're not saturated, although it's beginning to turn. And genes that are 5 to 10%, the curve green is going straight up. This is carefully corrected for the false positives and all that. Botstein's nodding that this is very important to get right. In any case, there's a lot more to go. And you can just calculate how much more you need to know. We need about 2,000 on average, but it varies with the background mutation rates to get down to rates that matter. And these are not rare things. Most mutations in most patients are in the classes that are not yet saturated. Most mutations in most patients are in the classes that are not saturated. So anyway, we really do need to get to this big data. We need to bring involve, we need to involve the whole world in this, patients in this. I think getting to 100,000 won't be that hard, but beyond it, we really do need to think about this in terms of big data and collecting the kinds of information we need across cancer to really be able to, to connect it with the fabulous work we've heard about earlier today. So anyway, um, it's a different kind of biology. It's one we didn't expect in the 1980s would emerge, where biology is driven so much by data and where data collection becomes so much of a part of what we do. But it's here and it's upon us, and the students are growing up expecting both to be wet and dry and don't see the distinction anymore, which is a wonderful thing. So I want to say thank you to the Breakthrough Prize organizers and givers. Thank you again to David Botstein, who has uh, made this all possible, and thank you to all of you. you. Sorry? Uh, let's, let's, have time, let's have time. Thank you so much for this fantastic pair of talks, and uh, questions for David, maybe one or two, and then I'll make a, a quick lunchtime announcement about the logistics for lunch. So, anybody? Uh, any questions? Any brave souls? Ah. <laughs> it happens to be Bob. Oh, pass? Oh. Yeah. Is somebody sorry. else? Ah. Well, I, I'm just wondering whether the number of uh, identified genes has now begun to vastly outpace 
uh, the rate at which we'll ever be able to do anything about them, that they're actually actionable in terms of responding to these discoveries in some way that affects clinical medicine? I think not. I think pathway, well, first, even if it were true, the first thing to say is we should know the truth, right? We should know what are the genes that could have an effect in the pathway, because I'd be shocked if tumors didn't explore them, for example. These will be the backup things that get used. Um, I'm not pessimistic about it because increasingly they're falling into pathways. One of the nice things about numbers is if you said, look, let's focus on five genes and learn them really deeply, you can get a lot of things done that way. But there's something that comes when the, when the picture gets big enough to say, ah, I've got 10 genes involved in IL-23 signaling, it's really telling me a picture about IL-23 signaling. So I think it means we're going to have to move to pathway-focused approaches. I think as we drug up here, we're going to anticipate that somewhere downstream there will be mutations. And I think this will end up being a helpful thera cancer therapeutic roadmap to tell us where to anticipate those sorts of changes. I view this as a handmaiden to the, the work that's going on, and I think we just have to know it. And the truth is, if it's complicated, it's the truth. <laughs>